So, uh, on this occasion, we are honoring one of the incarnations of God. Omigyan timidandasya genajana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gudavena maha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. We say that God is great, <laughs> but when you say God is great, it doesn't give you much of an understanding of God, because greatness is a general term. But to explain what greatness means, then we can get an understanding of how great God is. <laughs> God is a person, just like we are persons. God is also a person, but he is not a person like us. He's a supreme person. He's the source of all existence and all the personalities and all the forms that exist in this world are his energy, or you might even say he's created it all. It's his expansions. And we are also part of that energy, his expansion. So that's a little bit about the greatness of God. But God is all-powerful, we hear that. God is all-merciful, we hear that. God is all-good. Uh, God is all, uh, pre he's uh, omnipresent, he's everywhere at the same time. But yet he remains a person. <laughs> this is the inconceivable nature of God because if God doesn't have an inconceivable nature, then if he's conceivable by us, then where is his greatness? <laughs> where is his supreme position? So to understand God is very difficult. In fact, it's practically impossible. But we get some understanding of God when we worship God. Just like we chant, we're all chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. This is the great chant in order to, what we say, elevate our consciousness, our consciousness or our, our mental energy to a level that is higher than the ordinary day-to-day existence. In other words, bringing the mind from the material into the spiritual. And so in that chant, this is called mantra, man means mind and tra means to, to release or deliver the mind from the material to the spiritual. In that deliverance, there are names of God. So God has personality. He's a person, just like we are a person. We are not greater than God, so if God is not a person, how could we be persons? Or how could something less come from something, how can something more come from something less? So God is also a person. But his personality, he can expand, we use the word expand, sometimes we use the word incarnate, into different forms of himself, which are also himself, but a different form of himself. So one of the expansions of God is called Rama. <laughs> Actually, the whole name is Ramachandra. So just like when we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. We're, we're honoring the Lord, whose name is Krishna, now what does the word Krishna actually mean? It, it indicates a certain characteristic about, about God that makes him God. <laughs> Out of all of the names of God, Krishna is the perfect name because it means one who can attract 
everyone. <laughs> it means all attractive. So if God is not all attractive, then he's not God. <laughs> he has to have that quality to attract all of us. And as we learn about God, and as we also engage in worship of God, we find our attractive nature starts to become stronger. And we want to hear more about God. We want to learn more about God. We want to understand our relationship with God. So the original, we, we use that word original because there are many forms of God, is Krishna. He is the source of all of the other forms of God. And God is one. There are not two gods, the God of the Christians, the God of the Islamic tradition, the God of the Jewish tradition. All of the major religions worship the same God, but they refer to that God in different names. It's the same, just like we have many names too. We have a first name, a sometimes middle name. We have a last name. Somebody knows us by a certain pet name that they give us. <laughs> or some uh, nickname we also get, or if we do something regularly, we get a name for that because of the habits we develop. So we sometimes, even an ordinary person, gets three or four names, maybe even more sometimes. So God has many names, but all of the names indicate Him. So God's name is a little bit different than our name because we are different than our name. If somebody calls our name and we're not within the range to hear it, we won't respond to it. But when we call God's name, he can hear. And he is personally present in the sound of his name. So when we chant or sing the names of God, we can associate with God with it through that what is called the spiritual energy of his name. Because his, the name actually is... A, the quality of his existence in what is called sound or spiritual sound. So one of the names of God is Ramachandra. So when we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare. This Rama indicates another form of God and another name of God. And these names and forms are given to the Lord by, the, by his incarnations in this material world. So God comes from time to time in order to give pleasure to his devotees. And when sometimes when the world goes down in spirituality, the Lord comes to bring back the spiritual energy. So he appears, that's called incarnation or avatar. And uh, so this one incarnation of the Lord, his name is Ramchandra, we chant the name of Rama. And it is, he appeared two million years ago. <laughs> you might say, wow, how do you have records for that? <laughs> two million years ago, where's the sources? But um, spiritual knowledge up until the last 5,000 years was not written down. It was transferred or transmitted from pe person to person. So when great personalities, we call them saints or great souls, they are engaged in worshiping the Lord and sometimes they are present when the Lord appears on this earth. They have that memory where they record all of that and collectively, they transfer that information from generation to generation. And therefore, we have that. But then again, when this age that we live in, we live in a particular age, it's called the age of Kali. Kali means when the age becomes spiritually more difficult to practice. And therefore, people have a shorter memory in this age so 5,000 years ago, one incarnation of God, his name was Vyasadeva, he took all of the knowledge that was given in, in the scriptures, and in the transmissional scriptures, and he wrote it down in the form of spiritual literature. So in the last 5,100 years, we're getting that knowledge through books. 
The books only came into existence within 5,000 years before that, that all of that knowledge was given by person to person to person. And the, their memories were great, their minds were strong, their durations of life were much longer than what we have. So that knowledge is authoritative, and it's, it's also historically, uh, what we say, uh, what's the word, historically, uh, it's historical evidence that can be experimented. And so Ram, he's a special incarnation of the Lord. This is the one we are celebrating today. Actually, his appearance on earth is honored, was honored on Thursday of this past week, the April 30th. And so we are honoring it today for the benefit of all of us here who come on the weekend. And uh, he was a little bit different than most incarnations in the sense that he showed how we, as citizens of the earth, human beings, can live a happy life. <laughs> he showed by example. <laughs> There's two ways to teach. There's teaching by words, just like a teacher gets up in front of the class and gives you an ex it teaches you through his knowledge and his own experiences. That's one form of knowledge, which is authoritative, but there's another form which combines that and an example. So that type of knowledge is even more, what we say, uh, it has a greater effect on those who hear it, because when you teach by example, you're actually showing how to act, how to speak, how to live, and how to do whatever activities are given to you by the teacher through the example given by the teacher himself. Does that make sense? And so that kind of example or kind of that kind of teaching is the best. So when God comes in his different incarnations, sometimes he exhibits so many godly qualities that nobody can imitate. <laughs> Nobody can imitate because he is all powerful and we, have, we're, we are not nearly as powerful as God. But sometimes he comes, like in this particular incarnation as Lord Ram, he comes and he shows by example how we should live. And he was truthful, righteous. He was a monarch of a great kingdom called Ayodhya. If you go to the area of India now, in some nor northern part of India, not too far north, but pr mostly north, there's a place there called Ayodhya, and his appearance place is still there. There are many shrines, temples, and also a famous river that he, he used to bathe in when he was there, personally present, called the Sarayu River. <laughs> So all of these uh, historical statements that we make are also documented by the areas of the Lord who actually appeared there. So this place of Iodia at that time was the, was the king of the world. In other words, it was the capital of the entire world. Many years ago, the world was under one monarch, not like we have today where there were many states and many kingdoms that were all separate. Of course, the different areas of the world were ruled by different smaller kings, but there was a head king who was ruling the entire world, and all of the smaller kings would work under his direction. And that's how the world was ruled thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. So R Lord Ram, he actually came and took the position because of his qualifications as the king of the world. And he taught what it means to be an ideal king. <laughs> an ideal king is like an ideal father. <laughs> so maybe we don't have an example of ideal fathers, but an ideal father lives simply for the happiness of the children, for the care of the children, for the progress of the children, 
for whatever the children need, the father, mother is also there, same. They live only to do good, help and guide their children on the right path through education, through care, through knowledge. And so Ram, as a ideal king, he ruled the world with that mood, taking care of the citizens. And if there was any discrepancy in his kingdom, he would immediately try to rectify that. Not like we see nowadays, if there's a ruler and people criticize and the ruler is not up to standard, things still go on, <laughs> somehow. But in those days, the king and Lord Ram, who was, the, who was actually an incarnation of himself, lived such an ideal life, personally, in his own personal life, and also on how he ruled the kingdom, that nobody could find fault. Nobody could find fault. And therefore he taught from that position how a ruler should rule the world, which is the ideal example. In the land of India, people sometimes even speak about what is called Ram Raj. The word Raj means king, and Ram refers to Lord Ram, who is the ideal king. We want Ram Raj today. <laughs> so they actually speak that because he was the example of the ideal king. Just like there was an example or one, what, what Ram would do is that he would disguise himself in a different way and walk through the kingdom where no one can recognize him. And he would listen to what the citizens were saying, he would watch what the citizens were doing to see what they needed or if to, to hear what they were talking about. And one time he heard that someone was finding some fault with the way he dealt with his wife. <laughs> He was, from this person's point of view, he was, the Lord was a little too permissive in his uh, caring for his wife. And so that criticism was overheard by the Lord when he was walking through the kingdom. And so he became concerned, oh, people have found a fault. And so he immediately rectified that fault by changing his way of dealing with his wife and that overshadowed the whole problem. In other words, there shouldn't even be a slight spot on a leader, whether that leader is a teacher in a class, whether that leader is a guru to disciples, whether that leader is a parent to their children, whether that leader is a king to their followers. They have to lead ideally because it's a great responsibility. When you take others' lives into your hands and become responsible to what happens to them. And therefore, it says that no one should take a position of leadership unless they are qualified. <laughs> because nowadays we don't see that. We see that people are very enthusiastic to take positions of leader, but they make so many mistakes and they lead people sometimes in the wrong way, many times like that. But Ram was teaching that, yes, as an ideal king, then this is how you lead. And every day when the day was over, there was a big meeting of all of the leaders in the, within the city of Ayodhya, and they would all come and report their activities to Ram and Ram would also speak about his policies on how to rule the kingdom and get approval even before he put the policies into act. It says that a leader should also take advice from others and order how to lead properly. This is one of the other qualities of a leader. The leader shouldn't think, oh, well, I know everything. I don't need any advice from everybody, anyone. And therefore, because I am in that leadership position, everyone has to listen to me. But even, even a qualified leader will think, oh, yes, there are many other persons who are also intelligent 
Here's, these are called the priestly class, the persons who are actually saintly persons who worship in the temple. Because they have knowledge of God, because they have knowledge of practical understanding how to live life also, uh, a leader, a king, a monarch, a president, will take advice from them when he wants to institute a particular policy or a program within the society and get permission and advice and blessings. Blessings also. So he was God, but he was taking blessings from everyone. Isn't that interesting? How God, who gives blessings, can take blessings. <laughs> but he was playing the role of an ordinary king just to show by example how one in that position in this world should lead. Therefore, people around the world, especially in the Asian world, they, they're so, they worship the Lord in that incarnation known as Lord Ramachandra. And uh, that incarnation of the Lord is quite special, is popular because of his ideal principles. And he was also truthful. Now, this is a quality of humanness that is sometimes lacking within society. When you say you're going to do something, your word has weight, your word has meaning, your word has a contract with it. In other words, if I say, I'll, I'll meet you today at this time in this place, and then from there we will go and do something. But if I don't talk to you ahead of time, or don't give any in the sign, and I just don't show up, you think, oh, how can I trust that person? Right? So that breaks relationships when we are not truthful or honoring our own word. And of course, sometimes promises are made and promises can be broken under circumstances. But that's rare. But there are certain things you can't break. Just like, um, maybe this is not such a popular statement. <laughs> but when you get married, you take a vow for life, right? Uh, I agreed to serve my husband for my entire life. And then you get blessings from the priest, you get blessings from the spiritual leader. And the husband says, yes, I will take care of my wife. And they all agree. And then things change after that. So if you're going to make a vow, even if there's difficulties, even if there's some kind of uh, calamity that may come to disturb the relationship, that doesn't mean the relationship should break. And Lord Ram also taught that even in his time, just like he was the king, or he was about just before he became the king, his father, Dasarat, as his father's name was Dasarat, he told him that you will be the next king of the world. But then something happened. There was some envy, there was some jealousy, and Dasarat's wife interfered with that and said, no, he shouldn't be the king. In fact, he, he doesn't even deserve to be in the kingdom. He should go to the forest and live in the forest for 14 years. So when Ram, who was all ready to be the king the next day, and the citizens of the state were looking forward to the ceremony of honoring him as the next king, everyone was brokenhearted when that whole thing changed because Dasarad had promised his wife she saved his life one time when he was on a battlefield. And uh, he gave her two benedictions. And, one of the, and she said, I will not take these benedictions now, my dear husband, but I'll take them when I need them. So now she came forward and said, no, you should make my other son, Bart, the king, and you should push Ram into the forest for 14 years. And now Dasarad didn't like that. He didn't go, but as a king, he had given his word. So this is another point that we are illustrating. 
he said, I will give you, you give, I will give you two benedictions. You can ask him whenever you want, whatever you ask, I will fulfill that desire. And so when the time came, she asked that. And since he had made that promise, he was thinking, I don't want to do this. I want Ram to be the king. But I have given my word. And my word is like, it's for a king or a ruler or a person who's in that category of existence, to break their wor wor word is worse than death. Honor is worse than dishonor. <laughs> so he honored that desire by his wife. And he told Ram, he said, Ram, this is the situation. Your uh, mother doesn't want you to be the king. She wants the other son to be the king. So I have given her promises. This is what she asked. And Ram said, my dear father, whatever you ask, I will do. Now he didn't say, well, you know, the, all the citizens in the kingdom want me to be the king. And therefore, uh, I'm not going to listen because I have a, you know, a popular vote behind me. He didn't say that. He was obedient to his father. So this was another quality that God showed, obedience to superiors, which we don't find that much today. Um, maybe because we think the superiors are not qualified to be listened to. <laughs> but maybe that is the feature of the age we live in. But in general, the principle, especially in our scriptures and especially among civilized people, is to accept uh, a position of subordination to qualified people who will lead and accept whatever they say for our benefit. And Ram did that. He agreed, all right, yes, I will go to the forest, if that's your will, Father. And of course, he spent 14 years in the father forest, and there were many stories and adventures. After 14 years, then he came back and he took the position of being the ideal king. And then he ruled for many thousands of years after that. And that's a beautiful story. So the, uh, there's a term in, uh, in Sanskrit, it's called Maryada Purushottam. Purushottam means person or great person. And Maryada means one who is ideal in behavior. So um, Ram was an example of ideal in behavior. And therefore he's worshipped as the ideal incarnation of the Lord where people read about, hear about, enjoy uh, listening to his life and stories and at the same time try to emulate for those in the position of leadership his, uh, his ideal qual qualities and characteristics. So this is a little bit about the uh, incarnation of Ram. <laughs> there is much more. The story is called Ramayana. In that story there are 24,000 verses written in the scriptures describing the story of the life of Ram. There's one temple, as we mentioned, the area in the world where he appeared is Ayodhya. There's a temple in that place where those 24,000 verses are inscribed on the wall of the temple, inside the temple. All 24,000 verses are scratched into the wall, <laughs> exactly the way the verse is written. So, um, yeah, so we have that historical evidence of the life of the... So when we hear about the glories of the Lord, when we hear about the activities of the Lord when he comes to this material world, it does something to our, our existence, our consciousness. We learn, but we also experience happiness. Why? Automatically, just like we can read so many novels or so many stories from the secular <laughs> world or from the world that we, yeah, you know, mostly existent, and sometimes we get tired of hearing them or we get bored. <laughs> we want something new, we want something different. But stories about the, the Supreme Lord, we never get tired of. We can hear them over and over again. And at the same time, we find more and more enjoyment. 
Why? Because we are connected to God. We are not separate from God. We might not feel that connection, but the connection is there. God is the Supreme Spirit, and we are also spirit. We live within the body that we have, but we are not that same body. The body is different than us. We are the soul or the pure spirit that gives energy, life, consciousness, and existence to this body. It is explained that when birth, not birth, but when conception begins, when the, when the, the lady becomes pregnant, the soul enters into the womb of the mother and then the soul takes on the body of the mother and starts to grow in that way and then after nine months there is birth. So that soul gives life, growth to the body and then when it comes out, animation and that is called life in this world. And then when we get old, and at a certain time we have to leave this body, that is called death, that means the soul no longer can stay in the body, and it leaves the body and goes on to another place. So we are that soul that enters into our particular body that we have now. We live in that body, and after some time we leave. But what is our connection? Our connection to the body is our, our desire to live in this world, but our existence and our real connection as a spiritual being is with God. So we have an eternal, loving, I use that word with emphasis, loving relationship with God on the spiritual platform. And how to awaken it, just like we were, I, we got everybody up to dance for a while. So this dancing is nice, right? We'll do some more dance. Would you like to dance some more? Not too many yeses out there. <laughs> We're going to dance again <laughs> because our whole process is to sing and dance and then eat. <laughs> so these are the essence of our practice. <laughs> sing the glories of God. Dance when you feel happy. And if you don't feel happy, dance because you will feel happy when you dance. <laughs> and then... Uh, Take nice food. We offer the food to God with prayer on the altar. The, the cooks, they cook in the kitchen. And they cook simply for the pleasure of the Lord. They make nice preparations of varieties of things. And we bring all of that, a portion of each of the preparation on the altar with prayer. And we ask the Lord, please accept this as our offering to you. And then that food comes back. It's called blessed food. In, in our terminology, it's called prashadam. Prashadam means the mercy of the Lord in the form of nice food. So that'll be the finale of tonight's program. <laughs> and I think the devotees have cooked a very wonderful feast for everyone here because you are special guests for us today. And you should not, uh, we, you should not think that this is our temple and, you're, and you have come to visit. This is your temple also. Each one of you. This temple is yours because the house of God belongs to everybody. We are just the caretakers, that's all. And we invite everyone and anyone to come and take part in this spiritual practice, which is very, very wonderful, where we sing, dance, and speak about God. <laughs> so now it's time to sing and dance. Before we do that, would anyone like to ask a question? Or make a comment? Anyone out there? Okay, so we're about to begin our next portion of our program, which is, is called Kirtan. The word Kirtan comes from the etymological root word called Kirti. Kirti means fame in Sanskrit. So when we sing and dance, we are spreading the fame of God. That is the meaning of kirtan. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening to this small lecture. <laughs> and uh, please uh, join in with the singing and the dancing. Uh, we'll be singing mostly the Hare Krishna mantra. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. But we'll proceed it with a few prayers to honor the great souls, the great saints who have gone in the past. So, Punyawala, thank you very much. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs>